Now, at Imperial College, we are, of course, saddled with a certain amount of history, and um, being stuck with history means that our teaching, our undergraduate teaching is done in departments, but increasingly we've set up multidisciplinary structures which handle a lot of the postgraduate teaching, uh, increasing amounts of the postgraduate teaching, as well as um, uh, a lot of basic research. And in fact, um, I'm connected with a large number of, uh, of these uh, multidisciplinary structures. And what you can see from these, they cover, um, they originate from uh, sciences, from engineering, and from medicine. But this means that in principle, we have a translational pipeline that reaches deep into the basic sciences, extends through engineering, and in principle, all the way up into the clinic. Uh, and that's very important. And it's important that we gradually develop a, a cohort of uh, new young researchers for whom multidisciplinarity is the norm and who are expert in more than one area because that's where a lot of the future challenges lie. So I do want to say a little bit about structures and multidisciplinarity and, and how you do this in, in a modern scientific and biomedical research context. Um, so the multidisciplinarity drivers are really the need to bring new approaches into unusual contexts, and that's particularly true of translation from basic sciences through to medicine and ultimately into the clinic. Um, it's also true of connections between industry and universities or other research organizations. And it's important to reflect that if you have new scientific challenges and new ways of doing science, it often means you have to have new organizational structures in response. Now, um, I'm going to talk uh, just a little about the Chemical Biology Center, which is uh, one of these structures that uh, I helped to found. Um, it's a network of around 70 research groups, and this network, um, uh, to be part of the network, you just say you're part of it, but you are, have to be supervising students or postdocs in a joint way, according to our, uh, our, our philosophy. And there are about 150 full-time researchers engaged in the networking in various ways. And what it's about is bringing a physical sciences approach to selected problems in the life sciences by developing tools and technologies, be they theoretical and modeling or uh, instrumentational, uh, and uh, applying them to uh, basic biology and also to biomedical problems. This is what the network looks like, um, just to show you that most of the collaborations are between traditional disciplines. The different colors represent uh, different um, uh, research groups, uh, heads of research groups, and uh, just to point out that we have industrial supervisors. Uh, some of the color scheme's gone a little bit wrong here in changing to the Macintosh, unfortunately. Never mind. Um, uh, the, uh, these industrial supervisors operate with us in just the same way as other research teams do. So one of the ways in which we lower the barriers for translation to industry, and uh, actually the translation research needs a two-way interaction, is simply to have industrial research teams operating uh, with us in the network in a conventional way, at least conventional for us in the network. Other ways of doing this are to set up uh, co-located multidisciplinary teams with their own project management, which combine traditional physicists, chemists, uh, uh, and uh, uh, medics. Um, and this is like having a little startup, but actually inside the university, and that's an unusual thing to do. Um, what you discover is very quickly, even if these guys weren't originally multidisciplinary in outlook, they become so very quickly. Uh, and again, that enables the whole thing to develop and go forward rapidly uh, and to start uh, discovering new ways of approaching sometimes old problems. And I'm going to talk a bit about um, uh, one of the programs that's emerged from the network of this form, which is the Single Cell Proteomics Project. Okay. Now, the context of the biology is important. We've, we've heard about it, but the biological world really is changing, and it's changing due to the health challenges, to the new science, in particular, uh, omics, systems thinking, um, and the fact that we know that traditional modes of drug discovery are not succeeding terribly well. Um, these are all drivers for uh, looking at things in a new way. Uh, I do want to say a little bit about the biological context because I think it's very important to set the new tools and technologies um, uh, in, in, in context, and it's the context really that drives what's happening. So this isn't a biomedical example, but it is an example of how uh, something uh, quite extraordinary has evolved in the last 10 years. And this is that the statistics of small numbers of molecules uh, has taught us that actually gene expression is often noisy. And noisy gene expression leads to different phenotypes, even from a clonally uh, identical population. So if you have uh, identical clones uh, actually get differences in phenotype because the number of uh, RNA molecules are so small that the progeny have varying phenotypical uh, uh, behavior. And you can start to look at how this gene noise correlates between different genes by comparing um, uh, 
how much of a particular gene is turned on compared with another in a variety of circumstances to get graphs like this. So statistics start to play a real role uh, at the cellular and molecular and even at the tissue level. Another change in perspective is that we're used to looking at pathways, uh, biological, biochemical pathways in a sort of sequential way. Um, but it's become increasingly clear that these are just the tip of the iceberg and what's really happening here is that there's a large extended network of many uh, components which interact in a suppressive or uh, stimulatory way and that what seems to be a pathway in many cases is really just one element of a wider network. And just to show how bad that can be, this is a set of pathways for protein interactions in yeast. So what we're really looking at here is quite complex networks. And we need to be able to, um, instead of target a particular protein, what we realize is a lot of drugs already do target the networks in a complex way. They're often not unique targets. Uh, drugs often interact with more than one element. And we need to be able to understand and manipulate these networks if we're going to have good molecular therapies in the future. Now, if you focus just on protein activity, uh, the activity of a particular protein depends on a very wide range of factors. And in an ideal world, you'd like to have a good handle on most of these so that you can turn uh, molecular analysis of biological tissue or, or cell system uh, from, from less of a black art into more of a uh, quantitative science. In order to do that, you have to have very smart models and theoreticians who can actually handle these large and complex data sets in an appropriate way and who can effectively mine that data to yield interesting and novel results. Uh, a couple of examples I've just uh, picked out from a systems biology meeting at IC I was at last week. Um, a drug targeted against one organ turns out to change completely, remodel a network in another organ. Now that's entirely unexpected perhaps, but it's what you see nevertheless when you have a good data set and a good way of drawing out the information. So there are things that occur in the body that we simply are, are not aware of, no surprise there. But a drug targeted to one organ affecting another um, uh, in a very systemic way is perhaps a surprise. Um, Another one, which, which I particularly like, is that it's been estimated with a certain amount of um, veracity, I think, that there are about 650,000 protein-protein interactions in the human uh, interactome. Um, some are obviously going to be more important than others, but it does give you an uh, indication of the scale of the problem and why systems thinking is becoming increasingly important and also important for translational research problems. Okay. I think um, I'll skip over that slide and just talk a little bit about this single cell proteomics project. So this is a research team established a couple of years ago. It's, it, it's set to last for about five and a half years. It's five million pounds. And it's about bringing the expertise of eight different research groups together uh, to develop new uh, and novel platform technologies with an aim to uh, applying them to uh, uh, biomedical problems. What we're trying to do here is to develop uh, technologies that are more appropriate for the uh, needs of systems biology, if you like, uh, and systems medicine, indeed. Uh, and that means they have to be minimally invasive, sensitive, high throughput, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, you have to imagine that they can be turned into a sufficiently cheap and flexible platform to be usable uh, uh, in the clinic or for patient care. And we are focusing, to some extent, on, on high sensitivity, which effectively can be transformed into high throughput. There's a trade-off between these two uh, and also uh, high data content. So it's a sort of information bandwidth problem in, a, in an abstract sense. A direct application of the high sensitivity is to be able to analyze single cells. And one, one potential way of thinking about this is uh, what you might do with single cells, that cancer cells that circulate in the bloodstream um, or very small needle biopsies or just systems where there are um, very small numbers of uh, an important cell type available, perhaps from clinical, uh, clinical depositories or some such. Um, so, of course, the thing that kills you in cancer is uh, the formation of metastases, and uh, you do, in fact, find cancer cells circulating in the bloodstream. And it's now known, at least in certain cancers, that the number of those cells circulating in the bloodstream is uh, prognostic of your survival chances. Now, that's important and interesting to know, but it's not great just to tell a patient, I'm afraid you've got too many of these things in your blood, you're, you know, you've had it. What you'd like to be able to do is pull these things out and analyze them to see exactly what the makeup of that particular cancer is. And ultimately, one expects to be able to address this with a cocktail of therapies that are tuned to that particular um, cancer or that particular illness. And you can imagine extensions of this approach uh, in, in other therapeutic areas as well, at least in principle. <coughs> 